Hey, I was waiting for you. Now, say you're spending the day alone in your house, and you hear several loud knocks on your front door. You decide not to open it straight away. Moments later, when you do open it, you notice something strange. Someone has put a rubber band on your doorknob. If this ever happens to you, you should call the cops immediately. Someone in your neighborhood might be trying to rob your house. This technique became frequent back in 2016, but some burglars might still be trying to use it. The idea of fixing a rubber band on the doorknob is that this will make it harder for a person to close the door in case of a robbery. The band holds the latch open. In this case, even if a person tried to slam their door in a robber's face, the band would prevent them from doing so. On the bright side, and we are, you can use the same technique inside your home to your benefit. If you have an annoying door that keeps slamming, try tying a rubber band on this doorknob. The thickness of the rubber will slow the door down and prevent it from making a loud thump whenever it slams all by itself. Oh, and you can also try this trick in case you have a door that's always getting stuck. Make sure to fix the rubber band in a way that it crisscrosses in front of the latch. This way, your door won't close or get stuck anymore. Simple, huh? Still on the topic of rubber bands, here are a few other tricks that can make your life a tad easier. That pickle jar you always have trouble opening. Well, there's no need to sweat over it much longer. Here's what you do. Wrap a rubber band around the lid. Chances are you'll need to wrap the band around the lid a few times to make sure it's really tight. And that's basically it. The band will give you extra friction and leverage to open pickles and other jarred goods more easily. Now, in case you're renovating your house but decide to do it yourself, you're probably in for a hot mess. Rubber bands won't save your life in this trick, but they will make tidying up much easier. Wrap a rubber band around a can of paint, but do so vertically. This way, you'll have a string crossing the top of the paint can. You can prevent dripping paint over the border of the can by using the band as a helper. Once you've dipped the paintbrush inside the can, make sure to remove the excess paint by passing your brush across the rubber band you just installed. Hey, good luck with that! Next, you know what they say, all things are possible when you're DIYing your house. Victory or defeat. Now, if you're looking for ways of adding a touch of fanciness to your house, try upcycling something you already own. For instance, take a bland, boring-looking bookcase and add some wallpaper to its back panels. You can even play with prints if you want a modern, edgy look. You just bought a bunch of new Tupperware to make your fridge look picture-perfect. But, oh no, these new containers come filled with tags and labels glued to them that need removing. And they're always a bore to remove. Now, now, no need to waste tons of hot water and soap to try to peel them off. Here's what you can do instead. Take a hairdryer, blow some hot air directly onto the tag for a minute or so, and there you go, the label comes off all at once. If you don't have a hairdryer, then just hold the item up to this screen and my hot air will loosen it up. (laughs) Ah, if only it were so. If you decide to Marie Kondo your home and declutter your space, you have to start by throwing away anything you haven't used over the last two years. We all spend a lot of time looking for things we need in the amount of stuff we hoard. We often end up holding on to items that have long fallen into disuse, but since they don't come with an expiration date, we're not sure when to get rid of them. I mean, do you really need that DVD set of over 100 boxes? Now, to help yourself declutter, you can ask yourself the famous Marie Kondo question, does this item spark joy for me? If it's a no, then toss it. Your future self will thank you a lot for having fewer useless items. Now, a simple swap can go a long way in how luxe your house looks. Most people tend to use liquid soap and cleaning supplies in the packaging they came in. So, when you walk into someone's bathroom or kitchen, this space is usually heavily loaded with these branded packaging that rarely goes well with the space's decor. If you're looking for a simple upgrade, you can buy plastic or even glass bottles and replace all branded packaging in your house. For a more luxurious look, 
You can even choose to go with an amber bottle to put in your kitchen and bathroom supplies. They will certainly give a nice and cleaner look to your spaces. Did you know the color of your walls can influence your mood? There's a strand of psychology that studies the effect of colors on people's moods and behaviors. Now, according to these studies, if you're experiencing a lot of anxiety, you should consider painting the walls in your room white. An all-white bedroom reduces distractions and creates a tranquil and zen-like environment, which can help you relax and wind down. On the other hand, if you paint your walls red or orange, well, this can help to energize you. Maybe it's a good color for office space? Ever heard of feng shui? And no, it's not only the art of endlessly moving your couch around. It's an ancient practice that can help us with home organizing. Feng means wind and shui is water, elements that are traditionally associated with strong health and good fortune. According to this philosophy, a well-organized home can help us achieve our life goals and ideals more easily. For instance, if you're feeling a little blocked creatively and can't seem to get your juices flowing, try adding a little wood to your working environment. A little house plant will do the job as well. Bringing in the earth element will help to ground and to focus. Ah, yes, having candles around, especially aromatic ones, can also be good if you need inspiration and enthusiasm. Next time you go to the supermarket, make sure to buy good old mason jars. You can use them for organizing, but also as containers for a homemade aroma diffuser. Diffusers are very hype at the moment for several reasons. Other than having therapeutic effects, they can liven up any corner and make it more luxurious. Here's what you need to do. Grab a glass jar and add a few drops of essential oil to it. Use lavender or rosemary, for example, and add some water to dilute the oil. To finish, you'll need a couple or multiple chopsticks to dip into the mixture you just created. Well, there you have it. Just remember to keep switching the ends of your chopsticks every once in a while, since it's the moist bits that diffuse the most oil. Oh, and you can also buy an electronic aroma diffuser if you don't want to go through all the trouble. They are usually just a little more expensive. If you're looking for a nice morning of artisanal work, how about making your own cleaning products? For this experiment, you'll need a quarter cup of white vinegar, a quarter cup of bicarbonate of soda, a squeeze of any liquid soap, and two cups of water. Give it a good shake, and there you go! You can keep it in a spray bottle to use whenever you need to get some cleaning done. You can even use it to remove tough stains on your clothes and your carpets. Nice and easy, and ready to use! Now, if for some reason you ever, you know, decide to wake up a sleeping giant panda or cuddle it, just remember, that's a bad idea. Even fearless big cats like snow leopards are wary of bothering pandas in the wild. The ones you see in the zoo might not be that active, but they still have a massive jaw that can deliver a powerful bite. Their huge false thumb lets them get a good grip on their enemies. The most misleading thing about the leopard seal is its mouth, which always appears to be smiling. But they're actually rather aggressive animals and effective lone hunters. They like to play cat and mouse with their food, which includes penguins, fish, squid, and even smaller seals. Not so long ago, a leopard seal even dragged a marine biologist deep underwater. Hey, stop playing with your food! Ant eaters feed on insects, citrus fruit, and avocados. Watch out! They have no teeth, poor vision, and bad hearing. Sounds kind of like my Uncle Rudy. They aren't aggressive and stay away from people. But if humans walk on their trails, ant eaters can turn fierce and may fight. They get on their hind legs, use their tails for balance, and attack with their claws that are strong enough to hurt a jaguar or a land rover. Fluffy alpacas may seem warm-hearted, but they still have ways of defending themselves. They can spit up to 10 feet, and you don't want that stuff getting in your eyes because it contains stomach acid, along with chewed-up grass. They can bite with their sharp fighting teeth that are at the back of their mouths, and they have soft toes to give enemies a good kick. They can't really do more damage than you might get in a fight with a child, but it's best not to upset them. 
There are three things that brings out the nasty side of a Tasmanian devil. When there's a predator nearby, when they're competing for a mate, and when they're protecting their meal. Also Bugs Bunny, but that's a cartoon. These guys normally feed on insects, birds, frogs, and fish, and they like scavenging more than hunting. But if you intrude upon their home for any reason, be prepared for a painful bite. Their teeth are strong enough to eat through bones. Elephants are so clever that they understand the feelings of other elephants, and they even try to help each other. They can also take revenge on people who upset them. Elephants sometimes block roads and show up in the villages of people who have been mean to them. Male elephants get especially aggressive when fighting over females. Watch out for those huge feet, they can really do some damage. Better pack your trunk! Puffer fish can inflate to several times their normal size to protect themselves against predators. Hey, my brother-in-law can do that too. Eh, just kidding. Most animals shouldn't try eating them anyways. There's enough poison inside them to finish off 30 people, and there's no antidote. So, if it's just you, you'll need to invite some friends along to spread out the poison. Nah, I just made that up. Swans tend to see humans as the biggest danger to their homes and families. Male swans get especially aggressive during the spring nesting season from April to June. When kayakers, rowers, or anglers get too close to their nests, swans start hissing and flapping their wings. If you don't pay attention to these warning signs, the swan might even try to flip your boat over. Dolphins are the only species on the planet, apart from humans, that can take another creature's life for no logical reason. Males sometimes attack female dolphins or even baby ones, and they don't do it for food. If an angry dolphin chases you, you have no chance of outswimming it. They can move at 22 miles per hour. The top speed of Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps is only 6 miles per hour, so he can't help you. Slow lorises are the only venomous primates in the world. They carry poison in their elbows. It's transferred to their mouths during grooming to protect their babies. Plus, they scare off predators like pythons and eagle hawks using special markings that show how fearsome they are. If a slow loris bites a person who ends up on its territory or annoys it, the result can be rashes, anaphylactic shock, or, you know, even worse. Despite their massive weight and clumsy bodies, hippos can run much faster than people. And they have much sharper teeth. If you get in their way on their trip to the watering hole, their aggression kicks in. Before they attack you, though, they'll give you some warning signs. If you see a hippo yawn or make a sound like a laugh, it means it's about to get mad. Well, that's rather confusing, isn't it? Blue-ringed octopuses are really tiny, but their venom is a thousand times stronger than cyanide. They normally use it to hunt shrimp, crabs, and small fish. If this creature feels threatened, it'll flash its blue rings as a warning. If you don't pay attention, it may bite you. You might not notice the bite itself, but minutes later, you'll definitely notice the symptoms. Nausea, numbness, and even the loss of your senses and motor skills. So pay attention down there. Geographic cone snails are a seriously dangerous critter. They puncture their victims with a tooth that's like a harpoon, and then inject their venom. If a small cone attacks you, it'll just feel like a bee sting. If you're unlucky enough to meet a larger one, though, it could cause numbing, swelling, muscle paralysis, changes to your vision, and even breathing difficulties. Canada geese have been living close to humans for years, but they're still wary of us getting near their homes, especially during the spring mating season. At this time, the male geese can chase and bite people that seem like a threat to their mates, eggs, or babies. If you want to avoid being attacked by this seriously angry bird, the best thing you can do is just slowly back away. Squirrels have a lot of enemies, both in the wild and in cities. Their superpower against all of them is their speed and agility. Most of the time, it's completely safe to go near them. But they can still be unpredictable like any wild animal. They go on biting sprees occasionally. And watch out, they carry infections like rabies. They're more likely to go after your pets or kids but they can also bite adults. So, to play it safe, always walk behind your pets or kids to use them as decoys. Of course I'm kidding.
If you ever see a kangaroo get up on its hind legs, back off. This is their way of warning you that they think you're a threat to their females or their food. They are real pros at boxing with each other, and they have really long legs and sharp claws. Kangaroos jump into the air to give extra force to their kicks, which are powerful enough to break bones. A platypus doesn't have teeth, and it mainly eats insects and shellfish. It's one of only two mammals that lay eggs. But these strange things can still do you harm. Male platypuses have sharp spurs hidden on the heels of their hind feet. There's venom in these spurs that's strong enough to take down a dog. Koalas get most of their hydration from eating eucalyptus leaves, and they get all the protection they need from their sharp teeth and claws. When a koala scratches someone that wants to cuddle them a little too hard, they can pass on some unpleasant infections. (laughs) Raccoons can easily adapt to any environment, including your backyard. They rarely attack humans directly, but can damage your property and make you sick. They'll go anywhere to get some food, from trash cans to bird nests. And this is where they can catch a lot of different infections. Apart from disease, raccoons can give humans nasty wounds that take a long time to heal. When it thinks you're threatening its dam, a beaver will start slapping the water with its tail as a warning sign. If you ignore it, it'll try to use its sharp teeth against you to protect its family. So, it's better to just leave it to beaver. Hey, there's a special knife you can use to protect yourself against attack called a beaver cleaver. No wait, that's an old TV show. Otters spend a lot of their time swimming on their backs, and they don't care about cleaning up after themselves. That's why they leave behind bits of fish that attract insects carrying diseases. Apart from being so messy, they also have powerful teeth that can be used against any unwanted visitor. Cassowaries are the most dangerous birds on the planet. One of these can weigh as much as an adult person, and it has long, powerful legs and sharp claws. They can chase after you at 30 miles per hour. Luckily enough, they try to avoid fights. But if you don't want to be the target of their karate moves, keep a safe distance and don't provoke them. Got that? Good. You see their little cone-shaped dirt houses on the ground, like many volcanoes scattered around your yard. Ants are usually harmless little bugs, paying you no attention, just going about their day working hard. But if you've just stepped near a group of Australian bulldog ants, I have one word for you. Run! These terrifying insects get the name from those, yep, hard to miss, those huge spiky jaws protruding from their mouth. That's what they use to latch onto whatever critter happens to be their unlucky lunch today. That meal can include beetles, caterpillars, flies, or even wasps, spiders, and frogs. These ants will go after anything that gets too close. They're ferocious and smart. They'll drive out their competitor, the flat huntsman spider, by filling its nest with twigs, leaves, and anything on hand. This drives the arachnid out, leaving more lunch for the ants. But back to those malicious mandibles. That's not the only thing you gotta look out for. They use those jaws to hold on to something, a meal, an enemy, your skin, while they inject a highly venomous stinger. This is no bee sting either. They can do it multiple times, and it's harmless to them. It's the sting you have to look out for, not the bite. Though the bite's not a pleasant feeling either. And if one senses danger, it'll release a chemical in the air to alert the others. If you accidentally get too close to their colony, the whole dang brigade will come out and chase you away. And to top it all off, they have excellent vision, they're fast, and they can jump. They're also pretty big for ants, about as long as a matchstick. Stay far away from this one. Now, don't just watch your feet for dangers crawling below. Look out! There's an Africanized bee coming right at you. This thing is a lab experiment gone terribly wrong. It all started in the 1950s. The goal? Make a bee that produces more honey. The method? Cross an African species of honeybee with a bunch of European ones. The result? A ferocious Franken-bee, more aggressive and defensive than most types. Actually, at first, everything was fine. But one day, because of a laboratory mishap, 
more than 20 colonies of these monsters broke free. They spread throughout South America and up into the northern continent. They say these bees don't like it if someone gets closer than 15 feet, just half the length of a bus, to their home, and they all come out together to defend it. That's around 10,000 angry bees headed your way. They'll chase down an intruder over the length of four football fields. Hope you've had enough stamina to escape this bug. And then there are these nightmarish large bees. The Asian green hornet is the biggest, coming in at about the size of your thumb and 20 times more massive than your standard honeybee. These guys feed on honeybees, wasps, mantises, and even other hornets. They can reach speeds of 25 miles per hour in the pursuit of food or to drive an intrusive human away. Their stinger is long enough to puncture a beekeeping suit. And apparently, there are cases of these hornets spraying their venom into an intruder's eyes. Well, we'll take a break from flying frights and head to the beach. But a peaceful shell-collecting trip can end in a nightmare if you accidentally pick up a cone snail. When hunting or defending themselves, these snails shoot a needle-like harpoon through the pointy end of the shell. Just a tiny drop of its venom is enough for 10 adults. Oh, and there's currently no anti-venom for this one. Now, the sea dweller with the strongest venom in the world is the box jellyfish. The creature is pretty large, about the length of your forearm, not including those long, long tentacles. Yet, people may not notice it because it's see-through. The jellyfish grabs onto its prey with all those toxic tentacles. They have enough venom for 60 grown people. Not many can brag of surviving a rendezvous with this jelly. Oh, the sea is no safer than your backyard. And while you're cleaning out the shed, watch out for the brown recluse spider. They're not nightmarishly big, not often growing larger than the size of a quarter. But that's the problem. You'll easily see a tarantula coming at you, which are harmless, by the way. With a brown recluse, you won't see it till it's too late. The initial bite isn't very painful. Some people don't even know they've been bitten. But as soon as it sank its fangs in you, its venom starts to do its dirty but silent work. Within 3-8 to eight hours, you get redness and swelling at the site. Then comes the burning. And it intensifies from there. The effects are usually done after 5 days. But they can continue for up to 3 months. Even familiar insects can be dangerous, too. Like that fly buzzing around your kitchen? You know what journey he's probably had? Well, before flying to your place, it probably sat on the dumpster. Then it flew over to the public restroom, walked all over the floor, walls, and toilet seats. Maybe it stopped in a cow pasture, the zoo. It's been to all kinds of filthy places. And now it's walking all over that beautiful fruit bowl you have on display. And whatever microbes were in the stuff it was stomping around and putting its mouth parts on, they're now all over your food. The thing about bacteria, it makes people sick. So clean up and keep flies out. Now, take a closer look at that ladybug in your house. It could be an imposter. The Asian lady beetle is more yellow-orange than red like ladybugs. You can tell the difference for sure if it has an M-shaped stain on its head. If so, that's not a harmless ladybug. Asian lady beetles were brought to North America and Europe from Asia. The goal was to deal with parasitic aphids. But that plan backfired, sounds familiar. And the bug itself became a parasite. There were so many of them, they practically replaced the classic ladybug. And not only can they bite, they also produce a stinky yellow ooze that can stain your walls or any other surface they crawl on. The hag moth looks more like a spider than a caterpillar. All those arm-like tentacles coming out of its sides are covered in venomous hairs. One touch can leave you with a painful irritation. If you ever catch any fuzzy caterpillar crawling on you, don't remove it with your fingers. Grab a pair of tweezers. If one manages to sting you, gently put tape on the site and peel it off to get all the hairs out. Don't just use the same piece of tape twice. You could end up sticking a hair back into yourself. 
Wash the area with soap and water and use an anti-itch cream if you need. If you're in North America, watch out for the most venomous scorpion on the continent. Arizona bark scorpions travel in packs. So if you ever see one, know that its friends are hiding nearby. They have excellent night vision, so they can see you while you might not be able to see them. And what's really scary? They prefer to be upside down. So one could be hiding right under the table you're sitting at. But some terrors are nearly undetectable to the eye. They sit comfortably on the tips of grass and wait for their lunch to pass by. Oh, look! It's your leg! The monster grabs on and makes a human juice box out of you. Ticks might be small, but that's what makes them so scary. They can hide anywhere. Your grass, bushes, on the ground, in the leaves. You hardly feel them crawling on you, and their bite goes undetected. Sometimes they can even make a person sick. Ew, yeah. That's what most cockroaches hear during any rendezvous with our species. Like flies, they've got their dirty little hands and feet all over your surfaces, and possibly even food. And yes, they can bite people, though it's rare. And they're found on every continent except Antarctica. Hey, looks like I'm moving there. So how's this sound? A creepy crawly hanging out right in your bed as you sleep soundly at night. Even worse, it's dining on you. Bed bugs are so infamous, they need no introduction. But surprisingly, they're not considered dangerous to health. Though, who would want to be covered in small red bites everywhere? Also, don't assume these guys only hang out in dirty houses. They'll take any bed in any home if given the chance. Termites don't bite, they don't crawl in your bed, and they have no interest in what food you have in the cupboards. What they're munching on is your house. And they do it in secret. Most people don't even know they have a problem until it's too late. That's when wood structures start to lose their strength. Like bed bugs, they're tough to get rid of. And don't assume they're just in the walls. They can also be chowing down on the sofa. Yep, right there as you watch TV or take a nap. Sweet dreams! Octopuses have three hearts. Two of them pump blood to the gills, while the bigger heart circulates blood to the rest of their body. They also have nine brains. There's the large central one, but also each of their eight arms has a mini brain of its own, which is why they can act independently. Since each arm has its own brain, the central brain only needs to send a higher level signal to the arm. Things like, move to that nearby crevice, there might be a crab hiding inside. In the case of humans, the brain would guide and take control of each movement of our legs and arms. And with an octopus, arms act almost independently on their way to the crevice. It also tastes and feels with the suction cups on it. Since their arms are so independent, an octopus doesn't actually know where they are unless it sees them. The human body has an ability called proprioception. Thanks to it, we know where our arm is, even if we hold it, let's say, behind our back. 1816 is known as the year when summer didn't come. In April 1815, there was a massive explosion on Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It sent enormous clouds of volcanic ash up into the atmosphere. The majority of the northern hemisphere got covered with a shroud of dust and dirt and kind of refused to settle. In June of the following year, the cold winter didn't just come to an end. Frost damaged crops, and snow and rain persisted during the whole summer. In Iceland, you'll find some of the most breathtaking sceneries on our planet. Jagged mountains, fjords, hot geysers, ice fields carved into the landscape. Stunning yet intriguingly black sand beaches, such as Reynisfjara Beach. Most of the sand on beaches is generally formed from rocks that have broken down because of weather changes and erosion through thousands or even millions of years. And on Reynisfjara, the sand is a striking black color, and that's because of volcanic activity. Lava came out of an erupting volcano, got to the surface, cooled, and then hardened in the Atlantic Ocean, creating such a fascinating black hue. This beach is so magically stunning 
but it's also very dangerous because of its sneakier waves. That's when a few smaller waves join together into a single, really big one. This phenomenon can happen when ocean currents force waves together, or in the case of Rainosphera, when such waves come from an offshore underground cliff and get an even stronger pulling effect. Considering the ocean's low temperatures, too, it's definitely better to just take pictures from a safe spot. Some trees talk to each other. Yeah, not the way we do, of course, but, for example, acacia trees that grow over the African savanna can warn each other if there's something dangerous coming. When some animals, such as antelopes, gobble up its leaves, the tree immediately starts producing more tannin, which is toxic to animals. They also emit a special type of gas that travels through the air and warns other trees they should protect themselves too. You're stargazing. Such a chill night. And then a flash of bright light streaks through the night sky. A shooting star. So cool. But what we see is not actually a star, although we call it that way. They're meteors, which are basically small chunks of dust and rock moving through space. As they're passing through our atmosphere, they cause something called friction when one thing rubs against another. And that's why they glow. Also, the friction causes heat. Dust and rocks get extremely hot as they fly through the atmosphere, and the heat makes them glow until the moment they burn out and turn into what we call the shooting star. Sunsets in deserts are extremely beautiful because of the spectacular colors they produce a bit more than elsewhere. Sunlight consists of various shades of the color spectrum. When the sun is high in the sky, these colors mix together and our eyes see them as white. But as the sun gets lower, its rays have to go through a thicker layer of atmosphere before they get to us. The atmosphere then scatters shorter wavelengths of light, like blue and purple, before we can even see them. That's why the longer orange and red wavelengths stand out. In urban environments, air pollution can make sunset colors duller than everywhere. The clean air in deserts allow the vivid colors coming from the sun to shine through at twilight. Also, the moisture, water vapor, and rain engorged clouds can mute the sunset's hues. Since there's no rain, clouds are thin and wispy, so they filter and reflect sunlight instead of blocking it. Bamboo grows really fast. It's actually the fastest growing plant on Earth, sometimes growing about 3 feet in just one day. You can find it in dense forests, where only a little light gets to the ground, which means bamboo is under strong pressure to reach the sunlight as quickly as it can. There's an underground stem that connects bamboo shoots to their parent plant, so the shoot doesn't really need leaves of its own until it gets to its full height. Also, bamboo grows faster than other plants because it doesn't waste its time and energy on growing rings that thicken the stalk. It's just a thin, hollow stick that grows straight up. You'll notice some of the big trees have shallow root systems, sometimes even 10 inches deep in the ground. The roots generally need access to oxygen and water, and they can mostly find it in special underground pockets called soil pores. When a tree has ideal moisture and soil conditions, it can send roots deeper down under the surface and get what it needs. But most of the time, conditions are not perfect, considering bedrock, stones, and compact soil that physically prevents the roots from going down. Such obstacles also prevent the roots from getting the needed oxygen. So, when life gets tough, the tree will take an easier option. Its roots will stay close to the surface and spread out in different directions. Drought conditions are another reason trees can have shallow root systems. By staying closer to the surface, they can take most of the rainfall collection. Plants are exposed to the sunlight most of the time, but they still don't get sunburned. They appeared on land about 700 million years ago. And one of the key things they needed to survive was something that would protect them against the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. Those in the sea had seawater as protection. UV radiation is mostly responsible for sunburn, so land plants developed a special protein that detects it. This protein sends signals to the cells to protect the plant from the damage and effects of UV radiation. Basically, it's like they produce their own natural sunscreen. But this still doesn't mean they're 100% protected. You know that common belief that if you water plants in the midday sunshine, this can cause their sunburn? Some think droplets of water act as tiny lenses and then focus the sunlight onto the leaf surface. But they're not strong enough to actually focus sunlight from a water droplet onto the surface of a leaf. 
It's just that their natural sunscreen doesn't mean total protection. Too much exposure to UV radiation damages cells in the leaves and bark of the majority of plants. Earth's core is as hot as the surface of the sun. You'd think it could easily melt our entire planet, especially since the core is only 1,800 miles away from the surface. If the sun were so close, we'd be like french fries. But we're alive because the center of the sun is surrounded by a mantle of rock that's mostly solid. The crust we walk on actually floats on that mantle and protects us. If the sun was close, we'd only have empty space to protect us, and you and I wouldn't be talking. Also, to melt the entire planet, you'd need way more energy than the heat in its core. So there. Who do you think will win? A hungry grizzly or a ripe berry? An angry tiger or a beautiful flower? A huge python or a green bush? The answer's not so obvious. Now you'll see who really controls the jungle and forests. Meet the most dangerous plants on Earth. This is the water hemlock. It grows in North America in swampy areas of fields and meadows. Also, you can find this plant on the shores of rivers and streams. It seems harmless, but it's one of the most poisonous plants in the U.S. Water hemlock toxins can cause critical damage to an adult in 15 minutes, but only if you swallow it. Many people mistakenly confuse it with artichoke, celery, and anise. Despite the dangerous poison, water hemlock is used to cure migraines and intestinal diseases. This plant has caused a lot of damage to livestock. White snake root grows in fields and pastures. When a cow bites it, the plant releases a fat-soluble toxin. This poison gets not only inside the animal, but also into the milk. Young calves who drink the milk also become infected. Poisoned milk is also dangerous for people. The problem is that this plant, native to North America, is one of the longest-lived autumn flowers. Now in modern farms, the poison of this plant is not so dangerous. But on small private pastures, white snake root is the number one danger. We all know two kinds of beans, the ones we eat and the ones that Jack used to get to the realm of giants. In addition to them, there are poisonous ones. These are called castor beans. They contain one of the most dangerous toxins in the world, ricin. As soon as it enters your body, it blocks the production of proteins necessary for life. Without these proteins, your cells stop functioning. The more cells are destroyed, the more your body suffers. The castor bean releases ricin when squeezed. Several beans can cause dehydration, weakness, hallucinations, seizures, and other problems. About seven beans are enough to cause critical damage. So remember what they look like and never touch them if you see them in the woods. One of the most beautiful plants on the planet is also one of the most dangerous. This is oleander. Everything is poisonous in it. The stem, the root, and the pink flower. Even a tiny piece of this plant can lead to severe poisoning. It doesn't need to get inside your stomach to create severe problems. Just a little touch to the juice of the flower causes allergies. And don't try to burn it, as the smoke of a burning oleander has toxic effects too. And now, the most dangerous plant in the world. One touch of it will hurt you for several years. Or you may feel the consequences all your life. The Gimpy Gimpy plant, also called the Queensland Stinger, looks like an ordinary burdock bush. It doesn't look like anything poisonous at all. But if you stand next to this plant, you'll feel suffocation and watery eyes. There are thousands of tiny poisonous hairs on the leaves of this flower. They're so light, they can hang in the air and spread by the wind. So you should put on a gas mask if you want to look at the plant. But if you lightly touch Gimpy Gimpy, you're in big trouble. Some compare one Gimpy Gimpy sting to 30 wasp stings at the same time. Poisonous hairs easily penetrate under your skin and cause irritation and pain. The problem is that you can't pull them out. Wash with soap and water, use some disinfecting ointment, and you'll see that the situation is only worsening. The hairs can't be pulled out of there. They sit there, releasing toxins and driving you crazy. There's no antidote because scientists still don't know what components the toxin consists of. 
It can withstand cold and hot temperatures. Unpleasant sensations can last for several hours, days, or even months. People who touched the plant said that the pain from the sting returned even after a few years. But if it's impossible to get rid of the hairs, then the only way out is to wait for them to lose their toxicity. But there's another problem here. You can tear off one gimpy gimpy leaf with gloves and put it in the laboratory, dry it, and forget about it for a few years. And here it lies in front of you, a withered, almost destroyed leaf. It seems harmless, but it's not. Even after many years, the poisonous hairs remain on the leaf surface and still cause toxin effects. Gimpy Gimpy only grows in Australia. It loves the sun and dense green forests. It used to pose a severe danger to tourists and loggers. But now, all places with this plant are marked with a warning sign. At botanical exhibitions, scientists put this plant in a cage so people wouldn't touch it. Rosary peas can be white seeds with a black eye or black seeds with a white eye. You can find these plants in Africa, Asia, Australia, and the Pacific Ocean region. Some species were transported to Florida and Hawaii by people. You could encounter this plant even on city streets. Rosary pea seeds are used in jewelry and some toys. People who wear rosary pea bracelets probably don't know about its seeds toxicity. Rosary peas, as well as the castor bean, contribute to the destruction of cells. Interestingly, rosary pea seeds are used not only as decorations, but also for healing certain health conditions. This is the only poisonous plant from the list that looks poisonous. You probably won't want to pick it up when you notice it. See this red stem that looks more like an artery or an enlarged nervous system? And those berries are similar to eyes. Doll's eye looks a little creepy. Their internal structure is also as unpleasant as their appearance. Doll's eye has a dangerous toxin. The longer they grow, the more poisonous their composition gets. Doll's eye chemicals have a sedative effect on muscles and hearts. This means that your body relaxes so much that it stops working. You've probably seen this plant in reality or wildlife movies. Venus flytraps are rare representatives of carnivorous plants. Fortunately, they're not as dangerous for humans as for insects. But in any case, you shouldn't stick your finger in them. So here's how they work. The plant opens its mouth. There's a red petal with a fragrant smell in its middle. It's a decoy. A fly or some beetle notices this and decides to try it. They climb inside the flower. But the Venus flytrap doesn't immediately get closed. Tiny sensitive hairs inside the plant count the movements of the fly. If the fly has made more than two movements within 20 seconds, the plant closes its mouth in less than a second. This interval prevents the Venus flytrap from needlessly slamming when some garbage lands there. Then the fly becomes trapped. The bristles on the plant's jaws work like a cage. Prey cannot escape. Then the Venus flytrap injects digestive juice into its mouth, which destroys the fly. Five to 12 days later, the plant opens again and waits for a new lunch. The Venus flytrap can eat flies, beetles, spiders, and even little frogs. Giant hogweed causes the most extensive damage among all plants. It's dangerous not specifically for one person, but for entire forests and fields. Giant hogweed is an invasive plant. It's like a parasite. It multiplies quickly and destroys all other flowers in the area. Insects don't feed on giant hogweed. It's also problematic for people to destroy it, since giant hogweed causes an allergic reaction on the skin. It grows quickly, it's immune to poisons, and lives long. Giant hogweed can reach the height of a one-story house and be deeply rooted in the ground. It releases its seeds, and a light breeze spreads them for miles. Scientists still can't create an effective way to combat it. There's nothing that can defeat giant hogweed in nature. Well, not yet. Nature and evolution always find a balance. Ah, a purple sunset. You must have seen one of those at least once in your life. Normally, it's nothing ominous and has to do with the way light travels. The light that the sun produces is white. 
when it goes through a prism, you see light waves of different colors, from red and orange to blue, green, and indigo. Light normally travels in a straight line if there's no obstacle in its way. The shorter light waves, including blues and purples, are scattered easier when they meet with those obstacles, like molecules and aerosols in the atmosphere. Because the sun is low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise, its light has to pass through more molecules that scatter the violet and blue light. The colors that your eyes pick up, then, are yellow, orange, and red. But with the right conditions, you can see the gorgeous purple sky. Sometimes purple sky appears for much scarier reasons. It can be caused by hurricanes, wildfires, or dust storms. The concentration of vapor in the air increases, and the light scatters more than usual. Dust, a setting sun, and low cloud cover all contribute to this natural show, too. The sky turns orange and red at dusk if there's still enough light. Then it gives off pink hues, which mix up with a dark blue sky above. Now, do you remember what happens when you mix pink and blue? You get the color purple. Not every hurricane makes the sky turn purple, and trying to predict if it's going to happen is like trying to forecast a rainbow. Still, people reported several major hurricanes made the skies turn purple. Now, green skies might look just as spectacular as purple ones, but they actually also scream danger. They're usually there to tell you a thunderstorm, hailstorm, or a tornado is somewhere nearby. The unique color is a result of yellow sun rays getting mixed with the blue light coming from storm clouds. So you're enjoying a nice day by the ocean with a fresh breeze in your hair, when suddenly you notice the water starts retreating from the beach at a huge speed. This is a sign for you to start running as fast and far away from the beach as you can. This most likely means that a tsunami is on the way. A quick reaction maximizes your chances of survival. Now, if you notice the sea level is rising, but it doesn't seem too extreme, it could be another sign of an approaching tsunami. It happens in 40% of cases, and the incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The next one, way larger and more dangerous, usually follows in about 10 minutes. Another thing about tsunamis is that they like to arrive with some loud sounds. People describe them as thunder, the sound of a locomotive, a helicopter, or just a loud boom. Do you see a channel of choppy water on the beach? It's in your best interest to stay away from the water. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange break in the waves or an area with a different color than the rest of the water. Random bits of seaweed going in all directions is another rip current warning sign. If you happen to find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat, but don't try to go against the current. You'll only waste precious energy. Scream for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the current, swim diagonally to the shore. The next time you spot conically shaped clouds in the sky, remember it's a good time to start looking for some shelter. If it just stays like that, a severe storm is on the way. But if a cloud of that shape starts spinning around, it means it's about to transform into a tornado. If you have bees nearby, they can save you from big trouble one day. These hard-working little guys get more active than usual when they feel like a storm is on the way. They speed up to collect more nectar before it hits them, and once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10-15 to 15 minutes before heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it coming. Their secret is super-sensitive hairs on the back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. For centuries, people have noticed that animals act weirdly a couple of days before big seismic events. Dogs can't start barking, cows halt their milk, and toads, rats, and snakes leave their homes. It looks like animals can feel smaller initial shock waves that humans don't even notice. Scientists have tried to find some legit explanation for it and run endless tests and experiments. But so far, they're still on their way to explaining this mystery. Can you smell ozone in the air? When a thunderstorm is on the way, it's the most distinct and pungent smell you can pick up. An electrical charge of lightning sets it free from higher altitudes. The other, more pleasant smell of rain is petrichor. 
Rainwater wakes up molecules on plants, trees, concrete, and asphalt. Their aroma spreads all over the place. You can even feel that smell in your own mouth. All those positive ions in the air that a lightning bolt sets free gets mixed with ozone and your saliva. And that's how you get that bitter, metallic taste. When lightning is about to strike, you might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your palms may begin to sweat, and then you can feel your hair stand on end. That's a clear call for action, and that action is to run for your life. Positive charges are going through your body, trying to reach toward the negatively charged part of the storm. Trust me, you don't want these charges to meet. If you see no shelter that you can reach fast, try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Drop down your umbrella and stay away from wire fences, metal pipes, rails, and other metallic objects. And don't lie flat on the ground, it's likely wet, which means it's a great conductor of electricity. If you suddenly notice crevices in the asphalt next to your house, it could be a sinkhole warning sign. Inspect your house on the inside. Does that door begin to jam? Or maybe there's a gap where the walls meet the ceiling. Uneven kitchen cabinets and drawers, slanted floors, stairs that begin to slope, water leaking after every rain, and displaced moldings are all signs that a sinkhole is about to open. To find out if it's definitely a sinkhole and how dangerous it is, you gotta consult with an engineering company. If you find a sinkhole that's already there, you gotta stay away from the sinkhole area. Fence or rope it off to make it less dangerous for others. You'll need professional help to fix it. Some volcanoes scream when they're about to erupt. Small earthquakes, which often happen before, produce a hum. It's mostly non-audible to human ears, but sometimes it reaches a frequency that lets you hear it as a strange rumbling or hissing sound coming from the ground. This noise is known as a harmonic tremor. With some volcanoes, it's the sound of magma bubbles vibrating when they're going through crevices in the crust of the Earth. But it's not always like this. If scientists manage to understand what exactly causes these volcanic streams, they could create a limited early warning system for volcanic eruptions. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If its level is quickly falling, even if it's raining, this might be a sign of a nearing landslide. And if you hear a faint rumbling noise or unusual sounds, like boulders knocking together, it could mean debris is on its way to you. It's a sign to head to safety immediately, like right now. Now first, you probably already know that germs are everywhere, and it's impossible for humans to get rid of them. These tiny creatures train our immune system. We're becoming stronger when our organism constantly faces bacteria and improves its protection skills. So don't worry about what you see next. <laughs> Welcome to one of the favorite places among bacteria and microbes, hotel rooms. Yes, they seem to be so clean, but in some ways, they're more dangerous than a garbage dump. Everything is dirty at the landfill, and you're afraid to touch anything. But the dirt in hotel rooms is almost invisible. Germs are waiting for you here, and there are a lot of them. So the first problems appear already in the elevator. The buttons on the panel are swarming with various bacteria. Suppose no one cleans them with a disinfectant. In that case, these buttons become the arena where billions of microbes multiply and devour each other. Take a look at an ordinary apartment building. There are elevators too. The same people live in this house, transmitting the same germs when they touch the elevator buttons. Your body encounters these microbes often and quickly develops the needed protection. But different people stay in hotels. A guy from some African country can bring a bacterium that will be dangerous for a girl from cold Norway. Therefore, after you touch the button, wash your hands with a soap or disinfectant. So, the elevator opens its doors and you walk towards your room. Watch out! There's another hot spot ahead. See that door handle? This area is another beloved playground for germs. How many people have touched it before you? How long has it been since it was washed? Do you know why such a handle is more dangerous than a toilet seat? Most of all, microbes accumulate on our fingers and palms. 
when we don't wash them, we transfer a million bacteria from one place to another by touching the surfaces of different objects. So the best way is to touch the door handle with the same hand you use to press the button in the elevator. As soon as you enter the room, wash your hands. The good news is that hotel staff clean bathrooms and toilets much better than the rest of the room. So you're a bit safer here. But still, take a good look at the corners of the bathroom and the tiles. If you see black spots somewhere, it means there's mold. This thing can cause allergic reactions like runny nose and eye irritation. Mold can be pretty dangerous, but hotel staff usually watch it closely. So it's unlikely that there will be something like this in your room unless it's a cheap hotel. You don't stay there, do you? Oh, by the way, did you know that toilet paper in a public toilet contains more germs than the toilet lid? You make a mistake if you cover the seat with pieces of that paper. First, many people touch it, which means they transfer bacteria onto it. Secondly, dirty little splashes get on the roll when someone flushes the toilet. Microbes feel more comfortable living on soft paper than on the hard surfaces of the toilet, so don't put it on the seat. But if you see a metal or plastic cover on the roll, you're lucky, since the roll is protected from germs. Then, after you've done your business and washed your hands thoroughly, you have two options. Wipe your hands with a paper towel or use a hand dryer. It doesn't matter what you choose, both variants have a lot of germs. But if you use the dryer, bacteria will fly all over the room. So better grab a towel. Okay, you come out of the bathroom and find yourself in a danger zone. Don't think that all germs there are harmless. Some of the most common bacteria in hotels cause intestinal infections. If you don't want to spend the rest of your vacation or business trip next to or on the toilet, get ready to fight colonies of tiny parasites. The first thing you need to do is wash those glasses and cups with soap. Some travelers carry their own mugs with them, which is a good idea. Then look around and ask yourself, which places do people touch the most? These are the TV remote control, coffee machine, fridge, door handles, tables, hair dryer, and windows. But relax, you don't need to do the cleaning instead of the hotel staff. It's enough to have wet wipes with a powerful disinfectant. Wipe the surface of all these objects. Perhaps you worry in vain, and the hotel carefully monitors how clean the rooms are. <laughs> or you can tell the manager you want to have your room cleaned again. So you've wiped all the surfaces and jumped into bed tired. Unfortunately, you're not the only one to rest on that soft mattress. You have a huge company of bacteria. Of course, washing pillowcases and bed linen destroys germs, but what about the bedspread? Most likely, nobody washes it. Removing germs from the tissue is difficult, so you'll probably have to put up with it. But the thing you shouldn't accept is bed bugs. If you notice dark spots on your mattress, this is most likely the waste left by bed bugs. You're not hungry, are you? I don't want to spoil your appetite. The insects themselves can hide deep in the mattress. They can sleep there for months and then wake up to satisfy their hunger. While you're resting, they come out and bite your legs. If you notice small red spots on your skin in the morning, then bed bugs have, well, kissed you. The bites of these beetles are not dangerous. Some people may have a mild allergic reaction in the form of irritation on the skin. But the problem is that some bed bugs can get into your clothes or things. Then you'll bring them home. These creatures multiply rapidly. Therefore, if you don't want a colony of biting bugs in your house, then wash your clothes, clean your luggage, and go to the shower. But before that, ask the hotel manager to refund your money, because bed bugs are unex. By the way, even if the room is squeaky clean, it doesn't mean there are no bed bugs in it. Perhaps previous guests brought them. So your bed has no black spots, and you have wiped all the dangerous surfaces. That's it, you're safe. But try to walk on the floor wearing slippers or thick socks, as the floor is also a source of dirt. You spend several nights in the hotel and finally return to a clean and safe place, your home. Unfortunately, your house can also have many germs you don't see. Do you like to have fun with friends and play video games? Do you remember when the last time you cleaned the gamepad was? All your friends have held it in their hands, 
which means you've collected all of their microbes there. Your kitchen cutting board. How thoroughly do you wash it? It's not enough just to splash it with water, especially if you cut meat and vegetables. You can cut some squash, and its germs will stick to the surface. Then you quickly wash the board and put it back in place. But the germs haven't gone away. They're still firmly attached to the surface, waiting for you to cut bread. Then they'll jump onto the food and get into your stomach. Uh, how's that appetite doing? Still good? Another dangerous place is a dish sponge. Even if you use a good detergent, germs still accumulate there. The best way to get rid of them is to change sponges once a week. And now, you'll see a paradise for bacteria. A place with an ideal cold temperature and a lot of food, from fresh to spoiled. Hey, it's your fridge! There you put products that you bring from the supermarket. Hundreds of people could touch them with their hands, leaving millions of germs. Therefore, don't forget to wash your fridge often. And also, keep any meat away from packaged products, because germs on a rare steak multiply and spoil it quickly. Well, perhaps you're too worried about your health now. If so, then you should remember the words from the beginning of the video. Let me quote. You probably already know that Germans are everywhere. Wait, that's not it. Ah, sorry. Leaving your valuables or a chocolate bar in a car is a no-brainer. But there are other things people often overlook. Here's what to watch out for before leaving your car. Number 1 is aerosol cans, hairspray, deodorant, spray paint, household cleaner, and that sort. On the back of these cans, you might notice a storage temperature recommendation. Well, stick to that. Here's what can happen. Since these cans are pressurized, they become more sensitive to temperature. What's inside the aerosol may expand, and this may result in a crack. And then, the can can blow up. Temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit are already alarming, and it can easily get as hot as that in your car on a warm summer day. Researchers from the USA have figured out how long it takes a car to turn into a sweat factory on a hot day. Within one hour, the insides of the car parked in the sun reaches 95 degrees Fahrenheit or hotter, with an average temperature of 116 degrees Fahrenheit. So, if you want your car in one piece and running, take aerosol cans with you. The second item is sunscreen. Sunscreen is vital for your skin since it decreases the risk of skin complications and prevents skin aging caused by the sun. This includes wrinkles, sagging, and age spots. But when you leave sunscreen in your car, it gets exposed to high temperatures and it can ultimately shorten its shelf life. If you end up finding spoiled sunscreen, you might notice a funny smell when you open the cap. Plus, the heat might cause the cap to open and the sticky substance will get all over the car. The same rule applies to lipsticks and other cosmetics as well. The next one is plastic bottles. There are two reasons why you shouldn't leave them inside your car. Firstly, a plastic water bottle can act as a lens, magnifying the sun's rays and starting a fire. A fire department in Oklahoma conducted an experiment and confirmed that the danger of fire was real. David Richardson from that department says it can happen if the beam of light is focused enough. The second reason is related to your health. Many plastic bottles contain bisphenol, a potentially toxic compound. The BPA levels can increase at high temperatures, and that can be harmful to your body. There's a chance that this chemical can get into your drink after you leave the bottle inside the vehicle. Oh, and batteries! They can lose their capacity to work at full power when they're left abandoned in the car. You can buy a new pair and fix this problem, but it won't be as easy to solve the problem of leakage or a rupture. It can be bad for your health because battery acid is dangerous when inhaled and highly corrosive. The reason for leakage is again related to high temperatures. Battery manufacturers recommend keeping their products at room temperature. This fact is partially related to batteries. It's about electronics. Have you ever realized how hot your phone can get when it's exposed to the sun? You're driving and let's say looking at the GPS on your phone. Even in this situation, your phone can heat up. 
what will happen to it after hours of sun exposure. Phone companies are strongly against customers leaving their devices in vehicles because they might shut down, get damaged, or, you know, boom! Personal belongings are another priority on the list. A wallet or a handbag may come to one's mind first. Yet, a passport or even some change you leave near the passenger seat is sometimes enough to attract a thief. Better to keep such stuff out of sight, for example, by storing it in the trunk instead of leaving it in the back seat. Number 7 is also related to theft. Life can be too hectic sometimes, and it's understandable if you can't clean your car frequently. But leaving garbage in the car is another mistake. Thieves tend to search for messy-looking cars. They think that the owner doesn't use such a vehicle frequently. How about plants? I know it isn't that common to keep plants in the car on a daily basis, but sometimes you need to move them. The heat inside the vehicle can easily dehydrate the poor thing. Medications are another thing you shouldn't keep in the car for too long. The constantly changing temperatures inside the vehicle can decrease the effectiveness of your pills. Authorities recommend keeping most medications at 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit in a cool and dry place. Important documents that contain your personal data shouldn't be left in the vehicle either. Some examples of such documents are tax forms, financial statements, and school transcripts. A thief could commit fraud or identity theft using this valuable information. And there's also food and drinks. Experts recommend not leaving groceries or leftovers in a warm car for more than two hours or only an hour when it's over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The same rule applies in the winter too. Canned foods, for example, have a high risk of going bad if a can of sweet peas, let's say, gets frozen in the car. The effect will be similar to what would happen to soda. Let it thaw in the refrigerator instead of leaving it at room temperature. If the product doesn't look or smell normal, throw it away in a place where not even an animal can find it. Don't try to taste it, just trust your senses. If the item seems rusted or there are some cracks in the can, it should end up in the trash too. Eggs are another example. Normally, eggs shouldn't be frozen. But let's suppose you forgot one grocery bag in the trunk of the car and the weather was so cold at night that the eggs got frozen. Keep the eggs in the refrigerator before use. They should be hard cooked. It's your only option. You see, freezing causes the yolk to become thick and syrup-like. It loses that natural flow and doesn't mix well with other ingredients. You shouldn't leave your pets alone in the car, obviously. And not just because of a potential rise in temperature. They will feel uncomfortable without you, their best friend accompanying them. In their frustration, they might do something to get noticed, which can be, for example, ruining the interior of the vehicle. Now let's return to the winter season again. If possible, keep the gas tank of your car over half full. This can prevent the fuel lines from freezing. It also makes it easier to start the engine and hit the road in the morning. While keeping an eye on the fuel bar, it might be a good idea to glance at the tire pressure too. The cold can result in tire pressure drops. Not only high, but also low temperatures can damage some items. A good example is paint cans. They should be quickly taken out of the vehicle in the winter. The ingredients in the paint can experience expansion, separation, and clumping due to the cold. In other words, you won't be able to use this paint anymore. Weather also affects wooden musical instruments like violins or guitars. Changes in temperature and humidity can cause wooden instruments to warp, crack, or split. Glasses get affected by fluctuating temperatures too. In a hot car, plastic frames can bend. Or plastic can become brittle when it's very cold. This makes glasses prone to breaking. Don't leave house keys and garage door openers inside the car. This is an everyday practice for many people, but it's risky. They can get into the wrong hands. To listen to music, most people connect their phones to the car or listen to the radio. CDs are getting less and less used these days, but don't leave them in the car anyway. They might get warped and you won't be able to use them anymore. Can you think of any other items you shouldn't leave in the car? 
Are you used to picking up hitchhikers on your long commute to work? You might want to hear about the hitchhiker road scam. This trick preys on unsuspecting drivers. The scam typically starts with a person posing as a hitchhiker, who flags down a car on the side of the road. They may claim to be stranded or in need of a ride to a nearby town or city. In some cases, the hitchhiker may ask the driver to pull over at a specific location, such as a gas station or convenience store, where they will then disappear with the driver's money or other valuables. This scam can also be done in groups, where a bunch of people will flag down a car and ask for a ride, and once the car is on the move, they will threaten the driver and steal money, valuables, or even the car itself. It's important to be aware of this scam and to always be cautious when picking up hitchhikers. It's best to avoid giving money or other valuables to anyone who claims to need a ride and to never pull over at a location that is not safe or familiar. Hitchhikers are not the only reason why you might get into trouble on the road. A slice of cheese isn't something you'd expect to find on your parked car, am I right? Well, it might indicate something quite dangerous. One woman told the story of such an experience online, thinking it was just a prank made by some neighborhood youngster. She decided to call a friend and ask for help with cleaning the car up. But once the two ladies started rubbing off the melted cheese from her windshield, they saw something strange nearby. She remembered seeing a white van arriving. In it were a bunch of men suspiciously staring at them. She wasn't alone so she decided it was safe enough to finish cleaning up the car, even though they didn't feel comfortable being stared at. It took them almost an hour to scrape off the cheese that had melted under the heat. She did wonder, though, if this wasn't a tactic to rob a person. That's because most people would be so focused on cleaning up the mess on their car, they'd be distracted from keeping an eye on the thing they left in the car, like bags, wallets, or even recent shopping items, or worse, what if it was a kidnapping strategy? That sticky cheese would keep a person really concentrated on fixing the car, so they wouldn't be able to see suspicious people coming at them in due course. The key takeaway from this story, if you ever see a piece of cheese on your car, might as well leave it as it is, as long as it's not blocking your view and it doesn't really affect your driving. Your safest bet is to just clean it at home or take it to the nearest car wash. They'll know the best way to clean up the vehicle without ruining the paint. Sure, the piece of cheese on a car scam might just be a coincidence, but some scams out there are more legitimate, with this next one being quite the unusual method when it comes to snatching away other people's cars. If you notice a t-shirt or a hoodie on your windshield, or even wrapped between your wiper blades, don't be so quick to take it away. Again, it can be placed there on purpose to distract you while your car gets taken away. Drive away as quickly as possible if you can and get to a safe location that's well lit and filled with many people. There you can remove whatever object you have on the car without any risks. Some people have even found money under their wiper blades. It's easy to imagine that those who left it there probably had the same intention in mind. There are methods to help when it comes to decreasing your odds of getting your car snatched away. Keep your tires turned to the curb whenever you park it. If your car wheels are in that position, thieves are less likely to be able to move around with the vehicle. They'll see that your car requires more time and energy to be moved, so it'll become less of a target. Sadly, scams on the road are quite common. And one of the most widespread types is the infamous tow truck scam. This scam involves leaving oil, metal nails, or glass shards on the road and waiting for drivers to fall into the trap. If your car gets damaged in such a situation, the scammers will suddenly appear out of nowhere and offer to provide towing service at extremely high prices. They'll try to pressure you into using their services because most of the time, they place these traps in strategic locations. They make sure people get stranded where there's low visibility and no gas station in sight where you can assess the damage done to your car. In a situation where you have no other option but to give consent for them to tow your car, they'll also take advantage of the situation and take it to workshops unapproved by your insurance company. 
This means you'll have to pay even more money to get your car back. <laughs> if you've been a driver for long enough, you know that the driver who rear-ends another vehicle is always at fault. That's because you should always keep a comfortable distance from the car in front of you, so you can safely stop the car in case of an emergency. Some scammers will take advantage of this by repeatedly braking suddenly, causing you to hit them. This dangerous tactic is used to get money for supposed damages and even for make-believe medical expenses. To avoid falling victim to this scam, you should reduce your speed and keep a safe distance, especially from suspicious vehicles or chaotic drivers. If a scammer continues to bother you in traffic, the best course of action is to drive to the nearest police station and report them. Picture this. You're driving on the road, and suddenly a motorcyclist gets your attention and points out that your wheels are smoking. You quickly pull over to the side of the road. The motorcyclist then offers to help by calling a mechanic to check your wheels. Surprisingly, the mechanic gets there really fast, but proceeds to disable your braking system while inspecting the cause of the smoke. He then asks you to test your brakes, which of course won't be working since he's already disabled them. Pretending to be mm -hmm. helpful, he offers to fix your brakes for you, but will charge an enormous price for it. Moral of the story, stick to your trusted mechanic or towing company. You never know who you'll find on the road. Some scams aren't even that. They're just urban legends. Many people claim to have seen the wrong way man on the roads. One version of this story mentions a man stuck driving down one-way streets in the opposite direction, causing chaos and confusion as other drivers try to avoid him. The man is said to be crazed and dangerous, with a wild look in his eyes and a penchant for reckless driving. Other stories say he's not even driving, but that once you've seen this mysterious person on the side of the road while driving home, you should turn around to keep from going back to your house for at least a week. That is, if you don't want anything bad to happen. There are countless stories of near misses and close calls with this mysterious figure. Some even say that they've been hit by the man and that they suffered serious injuries as a result. Despite the many sightings and stories, there's no concrete evidence to suggest that the wrong way man actually exists. Many experts believe that the legend is simply a cautionary tale meant to remind people to be aware of their surroundings and to drive safely. However, the legend persists and continues to be passed down through generations, making it one of the most enduring urban myths of all time. Have you ever seen a sea cucumber lying on a bed of sand and thought it looked like a blob? Well, these creatures may seem squishy and defenseless, but they actually have some fascinating strategies to keep themselves safe. Biologists uncovered chemical compounds with the help of which sea cucumbers protect themselves from predators and even from their own toxins. And guess what? These compounds might be useful for human health. When sea cucumbers feel threatened, they can expel thread-like parts of their bodies. These tubes immobilize predators in a sticky, toxic embrace. The toxicity comes from some chemical compounds commonly found in plants. Interestingly, these chemicals are much less common in animals, but sea cucumbers have evolved to use them to their advantage. The substances are also known for their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. They're already used in a bunch of industries, like cosmetics. But using these chemicals as a defense creates a big problem for sea cucumbers. They need to avoid damaging themselves with their own toxins. It means their own cells can't contain cholesterol, the target that the toxins bind to and pierce. Instead, sea cucumbers have developed two kinds of cholesterol alternatives. It's a self-defense strategy, you see? If you can produce these toxic substances, you have to be able to not make yourself sick. Smart and cute as they are, now you know not to touch a sea cucumber should you ever stumble upon one at the beach. Speaking of things you should avoid at the beach, let's move on to the marbled cone snail, a creature so unique and dangerous that it'll make your head spin. 
This one is quite the world traveler. It can be found all the way from the southern tip of India to Okinawa, Japan, and southeast to New Caledonia and Samoa. That's quite an impressive range. And it's not just where it's found that's interesting, it's how it hunts. This snail may be small, but it's a fierce predator. It loves to chow down on other snails and sometimes even its own kind. When it's hungry, it'll stick out its long white tooth and shoot a poison-laden harpoon at its prey. And if that doesn't do the trick, it'll attack its prey multiple times over, just to be sure. Talk about determination, right? Once the harpoon hits its mark, the prey becomes immobilized and its muscles begin to relax irreversibly. And when the prey is helpless, the snail can begin to munch on it. Where can you find this fearsome creature, you might ask? Well, it's found in fairly shallow waters, typically on coral reef platforms or lagoon pinnacles, as well as in sand, under rocks, or among the seagrass. Watch your step the next time you're out for a swim, just saying. On the bright side, did you know that this snail's venom is being developed as a potential treatment for pain? Some of the chemicals found in this substance have been studied and they're showing promise. Who knew that this unusual predator could have a softer side too? Next on your list of creatures to avoid should be a little fish called the stonefish. Now you might think this sounds like a cute little pet rock, but let me tell you, it's not to be messed with. In fact, it's the most venomous fish in the entire ocean. These guys are masters of disguise, blending right in with their surroundings at rocky or muddy bottoms of marine habitats in the Indo-Pacific region. They're like the ninjas of the sea, waiting patiently for their prey to swim by before swiftly attacking and swallowing it whole. But here's the thing. You could easily swim right by a stonefish without even realizing it's there. Now, I know what you're thinking. I don't want to accidentally step on a stonefish. And trust me, you really don't. These guys have a lot of spines lining their backs, and they release venom when they're stepped on. Ouch! That venom can cause terrible pain, swelling, and damaged tissues. Not exactly a good day at the beach, if you ask me. But don't worry, the stonefish isn't out to get you. It uses its spines defensively, not offensively. So, as long as you're not disturbing it or stepping on it, you should be fine. Just be careful where you step and maybe invest in some water shoes. And if you do happen to get stung, seek specialized attention immediately. It's best to always look where you walk, shuffle your feet along the bottom to avoid stepping directly on the fish, and wear water shoes when you're in an area that could be home to stonefish. Have you ever had the pleasure of meeting a lionfish up close? They're such beautiful creatures with all those colors and fins that look like wings and accessories. It's easy to be mesmerized by their elegance, but don't be fooled by their stunning appearance. They're not to be messed with. In fact, they're one of the most dangerous fish in the ocean. If you get stung, you'll experience a lot of pain maybe even some allergic reactions. Lionfish inject venom through their needle-sharp dorsal and pelvic fins. They're not aggressive and won't sting you out of the blue, but they will act in self-defense if provoked or caught. It's not just their venom that makes them dangerous. They also have tiny teeth. But instead of using them to bite predators, they have something even more dangerous, their fins. The lionfish uses these spine-like fins to ward off predators. And unfortunately, that includes humans. So, while it might be tempting to swim up close to a fish and say hello, beware of its sharp spines. But here's the thing. Lionfish can be eaten. Some say they're actually quite delicious. And since they're a threat to reef ecosystems, human consumption is encouraged. Just make sure you remove the venomous spines first. If you're snorkeling or swimming near the corals in the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean, you might encounter these stunning fish. Keep a reasonable distance between you and the lionfish and they won't feel threatened or startle enough to sting you in self-defense. Sea urchins might also cause some trouble if stumbled upon. 
don't worry, they won't be jumping off the reef and flinging spines at you. They're not aggressive at all. These creatures are everywhere, from rocky shores to coral reefs, and are quite common in almost every body of salt water, including all of the world's oceans. So it's not surprising that sea urchin injuries are pretty common too. But hey, accidents happen, especially when we're distracted by a cute little turtle or too excited about exploring a new dive site. Now, let's talk about their defense mechanisms. These little guys have two ways of defending themselves, their spines and these tiny jaw-like structures that can inject a painful substance. Some species have long, sharp spines that can easily pierce even a thick wetsuit and lodge deep in your skin. Yikes! But don't worry, avoiding sea urchins is not rocket science. Just try to maintain a good awareness of your surroundings. Watch out for protruding spines in the sand and control your buoyancy. It'll help you stay at least a few feet away from corals, which may conceal urchins in their crevices. And if a shore entry has many urchins, pick a different dive site, no biggie. Now let's talk about first aid for sea urchin stings. Soaking the area in hot water for up to an hour and a half can break down the dangerous substance and alleviate the pain. Carefully remove the spines with tweezers and shave the area to remove those pesky spikes. Then wash the injured area with soap and rinse with fresh water. Apply topical creams if you have any in your beach bag too. And of course, watch for signs of allergies and contact a specialist immediately if you notice something weird. But hey, let's not forget that sea urchins are just one of many hazards of the deep. There are bearded fireworms, pufferfish, and fire coral too. So let's not be too hard on our little urchin friends. After all, compared to some of these other creatures, they're pretty tame. In the heart of a dense forest, a person embarks on a forest hike, delving into the hidden depths of nature's playground. But this isn't your ordinary stroll through the trees. It takes a turn towards an eerie and spine-chilling discovery. Our protagonist, with a twinkle of curiosity in his eyes, discovers a burrow hiding in the shadows. Curiosity outweighs mm -hmm. fear, and our explorer comes up closer. It's not some random burrow. This one belongs to a fox. So what if it's the wrong move and they should just run away? In the joyful season of spring, when nature comes alive with vibrant energy, foxes engage in their intricate dance of life. It's during this time that foxes seek solace in their underground sanctuaries. Throughout the rest of the year, when the world around them flourishes, foxes prefer to bask in the sun, finding comfort above ground, except when the weather takes a turn for the worse. It's in the most inclement conditions that they seek refuge in their burrows, shielding themselves from the elements. These burrows, known as fox earths, typically consist of only a few entrances, occasionally covered with scattered soil and debris. During winter months, industrious foxes diligently dig additional burrows in anticipation of the forthcoming spring. Sometimes, among the remnants of their subterranean journeys, lie the remains of fallen foxes, a testament to the cycle of life within these intricate underground networks. If one were to explore the vicinity of a fox earth, one would notice fresh traces of food remaining outside the burrows during the months of April to June. It's during this period, when playful fox cubs grace the earth with their presence, that remnants of their feasts can be found, a delightful sign of life unfolding. So what do these earths look like? After all, there are other animals with dens in the forest too. Now let's get to the heart of the matter. Fox dens, the elusive abodes of these mischievous beings, tend to be located in areas abundant in lush greenery. You might find these creatures hiding beneath the sheltering branches of a tree or seeking refuge beneath imposing rocks. If you stumble upon a cozy little hole that appears tailor-made for a fox, and you catch a whiff of that unmistakable aroma accompanied by other intriguing clues like scattered bones, you've likely discovered a fox den. Alas, my curious friend, 
There's no foolproof recipe for where these sly foxes choose to build their dens. They possess an uncanny ability to adapt to diverse environments, be it open grasslands, dense forests, or even the unforgiving tundra. Picture this. A fox's den consists of a minimum of four to five sections. We have the grand entrance, the ever-important ramp, the main den itself, and a secret room that doubles as a food stash. Depending on the size of the pack, there might be additional rooms to accommodate the whole gang of foxes. Mm -hmm. Now imagine the grand opening to a fox's den. The entrance and the ramp form a corridor leading about three to eight feet deep into the earth, connecting the outer world with the cozy haven within. Ah, but there's more. Foxes, being savvy planners, stockpile their foraged treasures in their dens. Yes, they have their own food caches where they hide all their scrumptious finds. The number of rooms within the den may vary, adapting to the size of the pack as these crafty creatures ensure there's enough space for giving birth and raising their adorable offspring. They might even dig extra tunnels and create additional entrances just to keep things interesting. Now let's talk about culinary affairs. Foxes are savvy gourmands who store food in large quantities, ready to weather the winter and the mating season. However, they're not extravagant hoarders. They usually stash away just enough to last them a few days, considering they don't dine on fresh prey every single day. Berries and fruits often grace their storage chambers, while any delectable meat takes center stage in their culinary adventures. Curious about the proximity of fox dens to one another? Well, if the land is bountiful with abundant food and fresh water, you might stumble upon two or three fox dens within a 10 square mile radius. But if resources are scarce, oh, you might have to expand your search to cover a sprawling 20 square miles to find just one den. But the saga doesn't end there. Foxes, true to their resourceful nature, often have multiple dens. They maintain the primary den, mm -hmm. often known as the natal den, which holds sentimental value. Additionally, they keep a backup den for some unpredictable circumstances. And let's not forget their knack for claiming abandoned or borrowed dens as their own. Such clever tricksters, mm -hmm. aren't they? Now, let's talk about these marvelous creatures themselves. Foxes come in a delightful array of species, sizes, and variations scattered all across our planet. But the star of the show is the red fox, found on every continent except frosty Antarctica. While most foxes prefer the tranquility of rural landscapes, don't be surprised if they venture into the realms of urban and suburban dwellings where their path might cross with humans. Ah, the encounters between a fox and a human. A tale of two extremes. Some kind souls attempt to win over these animals, offering them tidbits and coaxing them into their palms. On the other hand, there are those who tremble at the mere thought of a fox, fearing their crafty and ferocious nature. Now picture this scenario. What if a fox approaches you or launches an attack? Typically, foxes pose no threat to humans and harbor no ill intentions. They prefer to feast upon small mammals or livestock, reserving their aggression for hunting or self-defense. Yet, there have been reported cases of foxes crossing paths with humans, including incidents. Therefore, knowing what steps to take if a fox approaches or pounces on you is crucial. Foxes can indeed be domesticated, yet they remain wild at heart, and their actions can be wildly unpredictable. They might momentarily embrace their tamed side, only to snap back into their untamed instincts when feeling cornered, threatened, hungry, or simply scared. Naturally, foxes view us humans as potential threats, and it's in our best interest to reciprocate their cautious approach. Never attempt to approach a fox, even if it appears docile and friendly, as its temperament can shift within seconds, catching you off guard. 
avoid sudden movements, and resist the urge to inch closer, as doing so might agitate or frighten our fox friend. In most cases, when a fox spots a human nearby, it will swiftly scamper away or seek refuge in hiding. However, should you find yourself locked in a standoff with a fox, the best course of action is to take a step back and allow it the space it craves. Should a fox persist in its approach, or if you encounter several foxes nearby, my dear friend, give them a wide berth and allow them their space. Refrain from approaching or attempting to feed them, especially by hand. Let them carry on with their foxy affairs while you observe them from a distance. In a situation where a fox becomes trapped, such as finding its way into a room, I implore you to remain calm. Avoid raising your voice or causing unnecessary commotion, as it may provoke the fox to attack. Instead, remain silent, keep a safe distance from the creature, and provide it with an escape route. Ensure the doors and windows remain unobstructed, granting the fox the freedom it seeks. In due time, it will make its swift exit. However, if fortune frowns upon you and you find yourself in the unfortunate circumstance of a fox attack, remember to stay composed. Refrain from unleashing your pets or pursuing the fox. Just allow it to retreat on its own accord. If the fox persists and refuses to back down, a simple round of applause or a few claps might startle it away. Now you can enjoy the forest. Texas is home to some of the oddest, creepiest, and most unusual animals you've ever heard of. It might come as a surprise, but this state is full of creatures you'll hardly see in other places. So, let's have a look at the most amazing ones. This truly beautiful, bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny, usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. One tourist spotted a few of these pretty dragons on the shore of Mustang Island. He scooped one of the creatures up. He wanted to film it. Luckily, he put it back into the water before it could sting him. Otherwise, it would have ended badly since the blue sea dragon is venomous. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch. All because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese man o' war, a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells. And then they steal these cells from the man o' war's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact which makes their own sting more powerful, even worse than that of the man war itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the seafloor. Now, how about a funny fact? A group of tiny dragons floating together is called a blue fleet. And another fact, blue dragons normally lay a string of around 16 eggs. And it takes them three days or so to hatch into larvae. Blue sea dragons rarely make it to the shore. They're soft-bodied, so when the animals finally get through the surf zone and are deposited on the shore, they're already broken apart. And still, watch out! Even in this case, the venom in their bodies doesn't dissipate. But of course, blue sea dragons aren't the only unusual animals inhabiting Texas. Have a look at this nightmarish creature. Poisonous, slimy, and kinda immortal. Meet the hammerhead worm. The worst thing? It might be lurking in your garden while you're watching this video. You can easily recognize this worm by its creepy spade-shaped head. It doesn't look like any other invertebrate you've ever seen. Or any other creature, that is. At first, it was only found in East Texas. But later, 
researchers spotted these spine-chilling creatures in North, Central, and South Texas. Basically everywhere but the arid areas of West Texas. One of the most terrifying things about this worm might be its length. This creature can grow as long as one foot. Luckily, such giants aren't very common. Most hammerhead worms only reach 6 inches in length. You can come across two species of these worms in Texas, and both of them will have a dark stripe down the middle. The larger of these two species munches on earthworms, which is actually a big problem. You might know that earthworms play an important role in keeping the soil rich in minerals and overall healthy. If earthworms disappear, plants in such areas won't be getting the nutrients they need. Even for humans and pets, meeting a hammerhead worm isn't the most pleasant experience either. Hammerheads are the only terrestrial invertebrates that secrete a very dangerous neurotoxin, the same as pufferfish produce. Thanks to the sheer size of the human body, touching a hammerhead worm won't hurt you too much, but it may still cause your hand to start tingling or even go numb. It's much more dangerous for pets. There have been cases when dogs ate hammerheads, which left them feeling sick for the whole day. Interestingly, these worms are native to Southeast Asia. But they must have mastered the art of hitchhiking, since in the early 1900s, they were already found in the U.S. Keep in mind that if you want to get rid of a hammerhead worm, which is the best course of action, the worst thing you can do is chop it with a shovel. The thing is, Flatworms reproduce by ripping themselves in half, so by cutting it, you actually help the populations of the worms, turning one into two. That's the reason why hammerheads are sometimes described as immortal, which is a bit of a stretch since these creatures can't survive in vinegar or salt. Now even though you're safe from the hammerhead worm in West Texas, it doesn't mean you can't come across another dangerous animal, such as the land lobster from hell. These creatures are also known as vinegaroons, and they're not real crustaceans, they're arachnids! Huh? Who would have guessed? Anyway, these eight-legged critters have a really nasty bite, but it's not the worst thing about them. Land lobsters? Brace yourself! Spray vinegar-like 85% acid from their tails! Mostly they do it to protect themselves, but it still sounds like an unfriendly thing to do, right? A land lobster can also pinch a finger that's gotten too close with its heavy mouth parts. At the base of their abdomens, vinegaroons have long whip-like tails. That's why these arachnids are often called whip scorpions, even though they're neither related to scorpions nor have stingers. Summer rains lure these arachnids out of their burrows in search of food and love. Luckily, experts claim that land lobsters aren't poisonous to humans but they're very likely to leave a mark with their large pinchers, which they use to capture insects. Vinegaroons can be considered useful since they eat millipedes, crickets, scorpions, and cockroaches. They hunt by sensing the vibrations of their prey with those long front legs of theirs. Since land lobsters prefer to come out after dark, you aren't likely to see one in the daylight. But if you stumble upon one, check it out. If it's a female, it may be carrying her hatchlings on her back. Now, imagine it's the middle of spring and you're walking among blooming flowers and greenery. Suddenly, you spot something extremely bizarre on the ground. The animal looks cute, fluffy, and soft-looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out! The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. This one is called the pus moth caterpillar, or asp. There are several stinging caterpillar species in Texas. The buck moth caterpillar, spiny oak slug caterpillar, saddleback caterpillar, and eel moth caterpillar. And touching any of them can lead to unpleasant consequences. If you had touched that pretty hairy thing in the park, you'd most likely start feeling a burning sensation and develop an itchy rash. In the worst case scenario, you'd even have to go to the emergency room. The main problem is that people react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. 
Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensation and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. On the bright side, such caterpillars later turn into moths and butterflies that help pollinate flowers and trees. Getting rid of these critters means doing a massive disservice to the area where you live. Specialists are sure that coming across a stinging caterpillar won't lead to anything bad if you keep in mind the rule of thumb. If a caterpillar looks fuzzy, don't touch it. And the best solution to dealing with such creatures is educating people on what such caterpillars are, what they look like, and why it's dangerous to touch them with unprotected hands. Look at this pretty creature. It looks cute and totally harmless. But you should know that appearances are deceptive, and the blue-ringed octopus is an extremely venomous species of octopus. In fact, they are one of the world's most venomous marine animals. These creatures are found in tide pools and coral reefs. Despite their small size, a mere 5 to 8 inches, they are very dangerous to humans if provoked. Their venom contains a powerful neurotoxin called tetrodotoxin. When the animal feels threatened, its first instinct is to flee, but if the threat persists, for example, if you don't give up the idea of picking the octopus up, it will go into a defensive stance and display its blue rings. If the octopus is cornered and touched, it may bite its attacker, and it can end very, very badly. Tetrodotoxin causes severe consequences and sometimes results in total body paralysis. When the victim is fully aware of the surroundings but unable to move, the victim remains conscious and alert, but because of the paralysis, there's no way of signaling for help or indicating distress. Interestingly, in its chilling mode, the blue-ringed octopus looks brown or even pale, but once it feels endangered, it switches on its psychedelic pattern. Such a response is called aposematic behavior. In simple words, it's when an animal flashes bright colors warning others that, should they take a bite, they won't live to tell the tale. Of course, the blue-ringed octopus isn't the only dangerous animal that looks harmless out there. For example, look at this creature. This animal looks super cute, fluffy and soft looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out. The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. It's called the puss moth caterpillar or asp. Hidden among that luxurious fur, there are venom spines equipped with stinging cells like jellyfish. People react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensations and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. The next animal on our list is the poison dart frog. There are more than 170 species of these frogs, and funnily enough, not all of them are actually poisonous. Those which are secret, extremely dangerous toxins through their skin. On the bright side, the frogs never use these toxins for hunting or attacking. They only have them for self-defense. Experts aren't sure, but they suppose that the frog's ability to produce these toxins might come from a diet rich in toxin-containing animals, for example, centipedes or ants. Indigenous peoples in Central and South America have been known to rub their arrows and darts on the frogs in order to give them a poison tip. The main thing you need to keep in mind, if you touch a poison dart frog, seek assistance immediately. Especially if you've come across the golden poison dart frog, it's the most toxic one. The flamboyant cuttlefish is the only known venomous cuttlefish species. This creature has incredibly poisonous muscle tissue, despite its tiny, two to three inches at most frame. Watch out for a dark brown underwater animal with two tentacles and eight arms. It's also likely to have purple and yellow around its arms. Anyway, your best bet is to avoid biting into one of these intriguing creatures, and you'll most likely be safe. Predatory cone snails are very slow animals. This is the main reason why they have no means to capture their prey mechanically. I mean, they can't really grasp another animal or bite it. Instead, the cone snail has evolved potent venom that helps it survive. Probably the coolest thing about these creatures is that, among almost 1,000 species, there's no overlap in the toxins produced by each of them. Even though cone snails don't have fangs, they have a venom-covered harpoon they use to sting their prey. There's a tube-like structure at the end of a venom bulb, and a modified tooth can shoot out of the tube at a mind-boggling speed of 400 miles per hour. So being slowpokes doesn't actually bother cone snails. 
and since the venom is unique to certain species, some of them can deliver a minor sting, while others might cause serious harm to your health. For example, this reef-dwelling little fella unleashes a harpoon-like tooth to sting its prey, and there is no known cure for its venom. When you think of puffer fish, you probably imagine a bloated-looking creature with impressive 360-degree quills. But beneath those funny spikes, there is a vicious creature. And the most dangerous part of this creature is its poison, which is considered to be one of, if not the, most dangerous and potent in the world. The good news is that you won't get poisoned unless you eat the fish. So maybe better stick to the California roll. Now look at this insect and try to never approach it. It's the Japanese giant hornet. This monstrously sized creature, which can grow to be almost two inches long, is known to be highly aggressive. Its impressive stinger packs enough venom to make the sting very, and I mean it, painful. Some people don't survive being stung by this insect. Even though the venom isn't the most potent, the large size of the creature makes the dose too big. And if it's not one but several hornets attacking you, well, the consequences are likely to be dramatic. The giant hornet isn't necessarily unfriendly toward people or other animals, but it will sting if you provoke it. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny, usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch, all because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese Man of War, a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells, and then they steal these cells from the Man of War's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact, which makes their own sting even more powerful even worse than that of the Man of Wars itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see, that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the sea surface. The Arukanji jellyfish found in Australia looks tiny and totally innocent, but appearances are deceitful, and this baby the size of a human thumbnail is actually extremely dangerous. During stinger season, which lasts from November to May, tons of beaches get closed because of these itsy bitsy creatures. What makes the jellyfish particularly dangerous is their miniature size. People simply fail to notice them while swimming. The infamous box jellyfish, named for its cubic body shape, lives in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Stay away if you spot a creature with a squarish bell and long, dangling tentacles. And even if you only see a single tentacle without the jellyfish attached to it, don't come close or touch it. The box jellyfish can grow up to 10 feet, and each of its tentacles has about 500,000 microscopic harpoons to inject venom. Unlike other jellyfish, box jellyfish are hunters. They can latch onto you by wrapping their slender tentacles around your limb or body. With how dangerous their venom is, it won't be a pleasant experience. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the Jumping Choya, or Teddy Bear Choya. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. 
The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping cholla and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So, yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still, there's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania, 
Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whipped scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more.